Well, hello there, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. For today's video, it's part two of the $10 game console series. Let's take a look at how that thing works on the inside, but if you haven't watched part one yet, I'd recommend you do so first. So check the link in the description or click on the card in the corner when that pops up, and then come back to this video. All right, let's get right to it. All right, let's open this thing and see what makes it tick. First off, I'm taking the battery out just in case it shorts out or does something horrible. Looks like regular Phillips screws, so let's get this out. Oddly, there are five. Why is there no screw right there? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Oh, I just realized that the speaker is there, so that's probably why there is no screw there. It is being held together by what is undoubtedly a screw right under the QA sticker. You guys are probably screaming at your screen telling me that. Luckily I didn't force the issue. All right, and the back comes right off. Oh, well that's interesting. It's actually kind of a shiny single PCB. Potentiometer, speaker, which actually has a little peg there with a piece of foam so it keeps it from rattling. That's nice. You know what? The speaker is not terrible. It could be worse. All right, so we got a screw there. So it's interesting, looking at the back here, there's actually room for a capacitor, 100 microfarad, 10 volts, not populated, and some type of crystal that says X1 there. So let's get this one single screw out, and I imagine this thing will just come out pretty easy. Okay, all the screws are the same. Oops. The power button is coming out. All right, there we go. I'm dropping buttons here. So here's the start and select button. Those are on their own. And when you take a look here, here's the reset button right there. So it's got a little contact pad. I'll just leave that in the top. And then this was the, uh, the buttons for the A, B, you know, X, Y. In this configuration, well actually I have that upside down, in that configuration, A and B are in the wrong spot. So actually, if I turn it this way, yes, the letters are sideways, but at least it will be labeled correctly on here. And actually what really annoys me is the fact that I accidentally keep pushing the turbo buttons. So I might just rip these rubber pads out of here and, and then these buttons won't really do anything. But to be honest, do you really need turbo? I mean, it is sort of cheating on the Nintendo anyways, isn't it? So I should just take those out, and that way I won't accidentally hit them while I'm playing. So taking a closer look here, these are actually held down, these rubber pads. Um, there are little nubs that go through the back that keep these from sliding out, so that's, that's nice. So right here is a little tiny IC, and I'll have to take the magnifying glass to see what that is up close because I can't read that. But I have a theory, and my theory is that this thing is a blob, Nintendo on a chip. The entire Nintendo is under this blob and that the controller circuitry is actually similar to the controller circuitry that's on a real Nintendo. Meaning that this is the same latch IC that is in a real Nintendo controller. Therefore, if you cut the traces that lead from this that go to the blob, you could probably wire up a real Nintendo controller directly into the blob and it might work. Now let's move this. So just like I thought, there's the blob. That's the entire Nintendo on a chip. And then here's the flash memory of some kind. I'll have to look at the mag magnifying glass to see what this is. But that is where all the game code is stored. Now notice there are a lot of test pads around on this board. That is actually quite interesting. I'm gonna remove this LCD screen. I see it actually has a connector there. There we go, it's the type that you lift up. So there's the LCD screen, completely generic TFT unit. Not much going on there. Now while I said that I thought this was a standard Nintendo on a blob, I think it still is, but the conversion circuitry that converts from the composite video output, which is right here, to the LCD obviously is happening within the blob. So this 
is a chip on board, right? And maybe there are actually two dies under here. It's really hard to know. It's not like there's any kind of bypassing going on on the back. All right, so in here we have this IC right there, which is an LM4890. That's an audio amplifier chip. Obviously that's what drives the speaker. We have a 21.4727 megahertz crystal oscillator there, probably for running this thing. And we have an ST flash memory, which is part number M29W128GH, 70N6. So I'm not sure how big that is, I'll have to look that up, but yep, some type of flash memory. LCD connector is there, and there's really not too much else going on. I have a theory that the extra three lines on here, so this is the USB in, five volts and ground is what you know charges the battery. But I have a feeling when you don't have the power supply connected, this is probably outputting power and it probably goes to the external controller because there are three extra chips that go through these zero ohm resistors and those traces go through into the blob. So it's very unlikely that this is regular USB. I'm not gonna plug it into my computer, although maybe I should. Should I just try it? My theory is that, well, it's either gonna be USB or it's gonna be the controller input because the Nintendo controller only uses five volts ground and then three data lines, well, three lines that are for the actually IO, which matches this type of USB connector perfectly. So this could be how you connect a second controller on these consoles. So I don't want to have my turbo buttons functional anymore. So I am gonna just snip these right off with my cutters here. I know it seems rude, but I just don't want those buttons to get pushed anymore. So we're just gonna snip that right off. Now my turbo buttons won't be interfering. In fact, maybe what I should have done is, oh well, it's too late now, isn't it? <laughs> maybe I should have cut the traces and did bodge wires and actually changed this one over to be A and B and those two, I don't know. No, these are fine. It's fine the way it is. Just, I don't want those turbo buttons. These are now gone. Turbo functionality removed. Also, while the battery died on my camera and it was charging up a little bit, I installed an electrolytic here. I could only find a 47 microfarad, I think. I can't remember, it called for 110 volt. I didn't have that cap and I wanted to get something small because I needed something that would obviously fit inside this case. To be honest, I probably could have gone with a slightly bigger one than that. Anyways, that should help. There was nothing installed there. So that being soldered on, should do the trick. All right, so microsurgery time. You see I have a couple bodge wires on here. I noticed when the battery was charged up, the video output was far too hot. Basically the peak to peak voltage was way beyond the one volt peak to peak the composite NTSC video should be. If we look closely right here, that this, this orange wire is soldered on to the video output. This pin right there, that's the video out on this connector. And then over here, this is the same trace. So basically it comes down here, goes through there under this resistor, and then this trace just goes straight into the blob. So to reduce the overly hot video output voltage, I need to put a resistor in line. And to lower it down, I, I added these bodge wires, and then right under here, see the R10? It says R10 there. I, I used my X-Acto blade and I cut that trace. So this is now isolated. So there's no more video output anymore unless you bridge these two wires together. And then what I did is I tested with a couple different resistors. I just took what I had on hand and I found that a 47 ohm resistor, which is this one right here, actually produces a much better video signal. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this extra resistor off here. So we have just this one and I'm going to solder that onto these two wires. And then I'm gonna put capped on tape around here and just sort of tape it down so it doesn't go walk about. And then hopefully that fixes this bad video signal problem. All right, I used two clip leads just to clip those wires together, no resistor. So let me show you what this looks like when it's too hot. All right, so that looks okay, but a little washed out. But it's really obvious if we go into Super Mario Brothers 3. So the red curtain there was pretty washed out looking. And as this drops down, you'll see, so this should be yellow and it looks almost white right now. And that's not just the camera, that's to my eyes as well. So let me put this 47 ohm resistor in here and show you the difference. <laughs> okay, it looks pretty sketchy right there, but I will deal with it with Kapton tape. Let me show you how this looks now. Okay, so that looks a lot better right there. So let's go to a game. 
Super Mario Brothers 3, so the curtain looks much more red. Sorry for these wires. And watch the background. Look at that! Yellow now! Not the horrible white color! So I wondered why it looked a little hot, but I think now, let me see if I can start the game. I need to take a button, push it on the start button. One player. Oh yeah, this, this looks far better now. It's, yeah, looks good. Now I don't know what these, these lines are here. There's a little bit of interference, but yeah, pretty frustrating. They just didn't fix this one thing, which would have made the video output so much better. So I'm just going to clean up this wire and reassemble this thing and then see how it looks plugged into the 1084 monitor. Well, here it is on the 1084 and I got to say this mod did wonders for the video quality. This game, by the way, is called Devil World, or I think. And it was never released in America. It's a Japanese game. And it's something to do with, you got to pick up like these dots carrying a cross around and miss the devils and there's ice cream cones and I'm going to die. Yeah, and skulls and it. there's a giant cross. <laughs> I think it was a disc system game. I played it once before and I am shocked it's on here. And I can kind of see why this was never released in the US. But the board moves around and you're stuck in this sort of candy cane stuff here. I think this allows me... No, that doesn't even... What can I do? I think I can shoot. If I pick up a cross... Oh yeah, I can shoot! And it stuns the enemies. Or kills them, actually. Oh, they regenerate, though. So you got to carry a cross around to shoot them. And then the cross disappears. Oh, dear. Okay, here we go. We'll shoot him. All right, pick up these dots. Oh, I lost my cross. Damn. This game is very difficult, too. Because the board moves around here, and I... You don't want to get trapped. Is that a fried egg? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Ah! A side note, removing those rubber pads under here made a huge difference because now playing is pretty easy. You don't accidentally hit these buttons. The only thing is, is they... These rattle a little bit more, maybe, because these buttons move around, and I guess it's possible to get these jammed. I don't know. I might glue these in so they don't move anymore. Could have just put a sticker underneath so the rubber wouldn't have made contact, or maybe even a little bit of nail... Oh. See, I, now I think about it, I should have taken some clear nail polish and put that over the contacts, so when you did push these buttons, nothing would happen. But yeah, I highly recommend doing that mod. So that's it for my videos on this little console. It was interesting to look inside, and I have to say, after taking out those turbo buttons, this thing works a lot better, not to mention that resistor mod now makes the video output quality of this thing perfect. Here are shots of Super Mario Brothers on my original NES and then on this game console. There are some slight differences I noticed on the very edges of the screen. This game console doesn't quite show as much, but with my resistor mod, the video output quality now is perfect and looks basically identical between the two devices. Now, if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Of course, if you didn't like it, you know what to do, thumbs down. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button as I'll be posting lots more videos in the future. And put your comments and questions down in the comment section below. And thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.